Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome to day two of uh, representing homelessness. Um, if you were here yesterday, I hope you had a nice day. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, I hope you had a nice day as well. But obviously, yeah, it would have been better. If you, yeah, any, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, so a couple of quick, uh, just quick housekeeping things, mainly for the benefit of people who weren't here yesterday when, when Nigel uh, uh, did it. Um, the uh, fire exits, we're not expecting a drill. They're here, here, and also um, upstairs, your nearest exit may be behind you. Um, the, uh, we're doing um, a couple of things. We've got post-it notes in the, in the conference packs, which um, people, people have been leaving on. There's like a screen, a kind of hanging screen on the corridor just as you come in. If you want to put any thoughts about homelessness, about what we do about homelessness, what you'd like people to know at the conference about homelessness, please write on the post-it notes that are in your conference pack and leave those um, on that hanging screen just before the door as you uh, come in. Um, I will uh, just please uh, remind people that um, we really value your feedback at the end of the day. So there, sh there are feedback forms in the conference packs. Um, if you could e fill out a feedback form uh, today and, and leave it with one of the organizers, uh, myself, Peter, uh, and, and Nigel, or one of the volunteers, or just leave them on the reception desk at the front, or to be honest, just leave them anywhere and we'll probably pick them up. That would be really appreciated. Um, there's uh, tea and coffee um, and there'll be, a, uh, there'll be coffee at lunch because I realized yesterday that there should have been coffee at lunch sorry about that but there will be coffee at lunch this time um, oh yeah and a, and a reminder please could you uh, turn your mobile phones onto silent uh, please um, and I, I'm sort of talking to myself uh, as, 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 as I'm giving that reminder so it's quite a useful a quite a useful one to give um, yeah I think that's it in terms um, of uh, in terms of housekeeping stuff um, so I'm going to introduce our first uh, session uh, or, which is the, the keynote um, from the Museum of Homelessness um, so uh, we've got uh, uh, we've got Matt and Jess Turtle who are the co-founders of the Museum of Homelessness um, which is driven by people who are or have been homeless I, I mean it's based in London and the Museum of Homelessness does this through actively campaigning for change and through its creative programs, one of which involves collecting objects and real-life testimonies from people about homelessness issues. And today they'll be working alongside Lisa Ogun, um, a performer and long-time collaborator, um, to share some of these objects and testimonies. Um, so um, uh, if you could please um, put your hands together um, to welcome uh, the Museum of Homelessness. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, um, for having us today. Uh, I'm really pleased now to start our session by um, introducing Lisa, who is going to share the story of the bottle with you. So 
of violence and which the, violence, the police directed me to there. So when I got there, I got there like um, a day which is not a working day, and they put me in a place. The place is, I'll tell you, I was scared. I did not sleep because the place I was, there was, um, 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 do you call it ants, um, um, cockroach? I don't know the name you call this, but I know it has cockroaches. They were all over my baby. So the next day, I went to the social services, which I was told, this is the social services, and the first thing they asked me was about my status. I didn't really don't know what to say, because I just flee violence. I wasn't expecting my issue to be my status to be my first, to be the first thing they asked me. I thought it would be about how I am, how I'm being, why I'm there, and what I needed. So I got to the office, I told them about my status, and I told them that my baby is British, and when they started asking me about my stories about in, in Africa, and I fortunately they said to me, no, you're lying. I let them understand that you cannot tell the story better than I can do. My, it is my story. My baby is what I'm protecting. And I'm there, I'm so hungry. And I'm somebody is so hungry. And somebody is sitting down and telling me, oh, okay, your, your child is British. You can take it out of the country if you so want. And I told them, I need help. I'm hungry right now. Even if you have to ask me more questions, I am so, so hungry from yesterday. From yesterday, I've not eaten anything. I don't know who to ask, I don't know how to ask, I don't want to bother people, but people, right now I cannot take it anymore. And you can see, it was so obvious that my baby was crying, it's not settled, I need to feed him, but he's not getting enough milk from a mother who has not eaten for over like 18 hours. <laughs> and they said to me, in my face, sorry we're not getting anything for you. So, I, took my meal right in front of the security, right in front of the receptionist, right in front of everybody. And I was really surprised that nobody asked me, why are you taking your meal? That's some discretion telling that she's really hungry, she needs something. I was expecting somebody to offer me maybe bread or something like that. But since it's not coming, I have to feed on my baby's milk. And I told them, wherever I'm coming from, I've been starving, now I'm here. And it's not helping. And I thought you people are supposed to help me. But if you're not helping me, instead of taking my baby away from me, if you have to take me out of the country, can I go with my baby? You wouldn't know unless I set you in my shoes. You wouldn't know. You know how much this really affected me. No human is supposed to go through that. That human says, oh, it's just too much. But I tell you, Anytime I'm going to the office for interview, my heart is beating a lot. Like I'm so scared, I'm so like, they actually noticed this at the hospital as well. They saw the cry, you know the cry when you have tears on, my face, on your face and it's dry. And it's, I'm not doing it for anybody, it's just you. You're just pushing your body on the street, crying. And you just have to go through all this. And Coming to help you or something, and nobody is there. No, nobody is just my story. <laughs> Flee violence, and and it was worse for anybody when you don't have no one to talk to, no, no one to talk to. So I do this on the streets most of the time, crying, and I'm so so strong. But I told them so social services. I just want to work. I want to put something on the table and do my parental duty to my kids. But I get home, and this one that I have here, I'm not a love breaker, I'm not fraudulent, I'm just a mom. Simple as that. This is my baby. This is the only story I have. Why is somebody trying to take this out of the picture? It doesn't work like that. So, I don't know. I'm still scared right now. It is not getting better because you are still when you have to go to the same set of people where you have to tell them about your circumstances changes. 
So thank you everyone for listening to that and we wanted to open with one of our object stories. I'm uh, Matt Turtle, I'm one of the co-founders of the Museum of Homelessness and these stories are as you can see, real life testimonies given to uh, the museum by a range of different people covering a range of different things. Um, it's talking about homelessness that potentially some people don't always think about or see. And um, they're given in the exact words of people and um, you know they're very honest and we don't sugarcoat um, the issues here. And unlike other museums, we don't choose the object. The uh, person selects the object and gives that to us. And we take these objects to different sorts of places. So the bottle story was one of 20 first performed at Manchester Art Gallery back in October as part of our Objectified project, which you'll hear more about uh, today. And they also go to different sorts of places as well, like day centers, hostels, and the halls of power as well. And we can learn so much from these stories. Um, I'm Jess, uh, the other co-founder, and uh, the reason that we work in this way is because the Museum of Homelessness is a social justice museum. Everything that we do is geared towards trying to make some change happen. So the object story is a really important part of that, and we're so grateful to the donors who give them and who are able to tell the honest reality about the things that they're experiencing, um, so that then we can work with our talented storytellers to get those messages out as far and wide as possible. And they tell us so much, so that bottle story, it, it cuts against many of the uh, things in society that for the general public might come to mind when they think about homelessness. So for many people, thinking about homelessness would be the image of uh, like a single middle-aged white man. They might not think of the, the donor who gave that bottle story. You know, that woman is much more invisible. And that's very interesting to us and it's something that we want to change. So we do a lot of thinking about history, obviously in the Museum of Homelessness. And the history can tell us how public perceptions are shaped, right? So it's really interesting, for example, when you look back at legislation and things like that, um, you can find these moments in history where things get crystallized and then they create public opinion. So the 1977 Housing and Homeless Persons Act was a really important piece of legislation. It was the first time that local authorities actually had a statutory duty to house people. But it was only some people within that legislation. It was mainly focused on um, those deemed vulnerable, those deemed in need, uh, families, etc., and people who, who were with priority need. So what that meant was that a lot of single homeless people were excluded from the legislation. And what that meant in turn was that the homelessness sector that we know and have today has built up to fill that gap. So the homelessness sector is mainly focusing on single homeless people. Um, this 
annual report from the Campaign for Homeless and Rootless in 1978-79 was campaigning against the legislation or saying, look, this is an issue, some people are going to be left out. And that marked the beginning of the sector that we know today. And of course, then all the messages and campaigning and fundraising that comes out of that sector shapes public opinion about what homelessness is. So that's how we get to these places. Um, and as the Museum of Homelessness, we see it a bit as our job to navigate that and maybe to um, change that so that things are a bit more equitable in the messages that people receive. So this, although you can't see the pages of this report, um, it's saying many of the things that we talk about now. And, um, and a lot of people in that report were quite annoyed really about the Housing and Homeless Persons Act and they were quite pissed off about it just like we are a bit today. And so there were other things that abound that we feel is important to talk about. And so it's really good to be here at this conference today to have some of these conversations. Um, we're gonna talk through a couple of these things now. We, um, if you don't mind, like us just using this space as a little bit of event space. So there's a few things that piss us off in the Museum of Homelessness. When we have our meetings, when our people gather together in our WhatsApp groups, on Twitter, whatever, there's some stuff that comes up time and time again that people get annoyed with. So the first one, we got three things. The first one is something that we call poverty porn. And it really does piss us off, right? And it's got quite a long history. This is Jack London's People of the Abyss. Uh, which was the early 1900s, people going on poverty safari into the East End and then writing about it. This is uh, an article that's in our collection, um, was 1990, I think, and is the esteemed photojournalist, war correspondent, uh, Don McCullen, who would go into homelessness settings and take pictures from that perspective. Now, he's extremely respected. He's just had a retrospective at Tate. But there is something about this that is like a fleeting encounter and very much looking in from the outside, and it doesn't tell the full story. And actually, what good does it do for people who are going through the issues themselves? And it's not to take issue necessarily with people like Jack London or the tradition of Greenwoodian social observation, which comes from uh, Victorian times, but it's to take issue with this um, notion of how it's been updated for a 21st century con context, not necessarily to critique Ed Stafford either, but it's this probably came up yesterday in the media session about how we tell more complicated, more nuanced stories about homelessness that don't fall into the established tropes. When this, um, do you mind just going back to that, Matt? Sorry. When this was being aired, this programme, I remember we held a vigil outside Downing Street um, for people who had died whilst homeless, and this had been aired the night before, and I remember Gary one of our crew, I remember you arriving at that vigil really, really angry because you just watched this and you felt like the representation on that programme was unfair, it was exploiting people and it wasn't doing any good. So this part of like a long historical trajectory that we see here, and even if it's well-intentioned, I'm sure Ed Stafford was, I'm not sure the Channel 4 production team were, given some of the stories I've heard of how they interacted with people on the streets, but even if it's well-intentioned, it does damage, I think. This next slide is blank because um, it really relates to something we won't really want to put out into, um, in our presentations and it relates to these kind of oversimplified narratives that are often used people, uh, within messaging, so campaigning messaging, fundraising messaging, really squashing someone's life story into our 140 word tweet. That's something that we want to kind of campaign against as well. It's quite often like used for fundraising. I think Crisis in their um, reframing homelessness report, which came out last year, that good piece of research, it talks about that. It talks about how it's actually disempowering to have these sort of triumph narratives, which are very simplified. Like anyone who's been through difficult times will know it's not an A to B, right? It's not a, a linear thing, uh, recovery from anything, from homelessness, from um, substance misuse is complicated and it goes like this uh, and it takes time and it takes lots and lots of different experiences to get through it so that's another thing that we find tricky about some of the messages of today and you know some of these points are interrelated but we want to talk also about this kind of bias that exists in the way that people are described so in this particular um, headline which was a, a murder in Redbury uh, in Ilford recently we're seeing language which doesn't really acknowledge the appalling tragedy that's taken place it's described as an arson attack uh, and 
I think if this had been another person, um, potentially someone who wasn't homeless, you might have a different kind of headline. So that's something that we're trying to tease out the kind of bias and the dehumanization that can occur when people talk about this issue outside of places like uh, this conference, for example. So back to the story of the bottle, I have invented a little bit. Um, what that story was so clear in that story, and particularly towards the end of it, is that the person is asking us to listen, like to listen to her story. And, you know, you have to think, how has it got to the point where people can feel that invisible? You know, and, and how has it got to the point in society where a mother can stand in a, a space where she's meant to be able to get support, where people go when they're on their knees and have to drink milk that she has expressed. And this is the last bit of food her and her baby have left. Like, how is that possible with no one intervening? So this is something that we really wanted to explore in Museum Homelessness because when we're campaigning about this stuff, it's not enough to say there's inequality and we have to fight it. We've got to look behind that and see what's going on to make the conditions that make that inequality possible. So that's exactly what we did last year, and we decided to look at it by collaborating with a neuroscientist and seeing what that could tell us. So the bottle story, as I've sort of already covered, was uh, said was you know one of these 20 stories, and um, it took place in October and has been ongoing. And Dr. Lasana Harris is a social neuroscientist who has spent over 10 years researching what he calls dehumanized perception, and that can play out in a, a range of different ways. And he kind of the thing he talks about is just how strange that is when we ascribe human humanity to all sorts of different things, even weather, even weather, which I find startling, hurricanes and Mickey Mouse and pets and furniture, a range of different things. So how strange it is that dehumanized perception occurs when, we, um, when we're thinking about things, uh, when things take place in society, like playing violent video games, watching uh, pornography, and his research into... Um, working with marginalized people has revealed a similar neural phenomenon that takes place, the medial prefrontal cortex not activating when you walk on by. And that can literally allow, create the conditions for you to perceive someone as uh, no more than an object. Um, so this is extremely, uh, you know, wow very, very troubling research. Um, and he uses he infers really from that that it's the use of kind of categorized ways of approaching the subject which make this possible. So he kind of comes up with an example that if you say that you're relaxing in a chair, you're inferring something about someone's mind. So, so social cognition is activating. Um, you're, you're getting inside someone's head. That's another term he uses. And frequently... When that isn't occurring, it's when we're seeing a more kind of categorical, distance-led approach to talking about these issues. Um, so that's something that's been at the heart of our project and something we tried to find out more about within Objectified. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the presentation later on. So dehumanized perception, I think anyone who has been homeless, who is homeless, who has worked or volunteered in the field will be familiar with that thing. We had an event yesterday and someone with no experience of homelessness asked one of our community members, what can I do as an individual to help? And he simply said, acknowledge people, right? We all know that. It's walking by, uh, being walked by so, so many times in the day is extremely damaging and that is um, the individual interaction where dehumanized perception is occurring that's what it allows people to do just walk on by and then we start thinking what what does it mean then on a structural level if someone has a dehumanized perception kicking in and they're making decisions at a senior level what does that look like can we find things where that's coming out in society and when we were researching objectified we found this quote came out, does anyone remember? There was a big storm in The Guardian about it. He's the chair of the British Dental Association. And he says, these are difficult patients who rarely complete a course of treatment and attend irregularly, if at all. If we took in all the no-hopers who ring us, I suspect we'd miss our targets by a country mile. Now, that 
put a fire in our belly with Objectified and we um, were really lucky to partner with um, the Patient Safety Centre in Manchester and be able to do some work with the NHS commissioners and practitioners up there because we thought if that's happening in healthcare settings then how damaging and some of the stories that we collected said from the person, from the patient's perspective, exactly situations where that had happened on wards and things like that as well. So that's happening in healthcare. And then we've got other examples, you know, tragically all too clear that some lives are more valuable than others. Some people are not seen as fully valuable. We collected this from the march after um, the tragedy at Grenfell Tower the following day. These were up all over Kensington and Chelsea. And you think, how can people make decisions that will lead to a tragedy like that? Um, the Windrush scandal and the deportations that continue. Again, these are decisions that are being taken that I, I feel like dehumanised perception has to play a role in it. Otherwise, how is it possible? MPs <clears throat> stepping over dead people on their way into Parliament, you know, signing and voting for austerity measures that they are quite aware will kill hundreds if not thousands of people. This is a project that we've recently taken on from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism to document and honour the lives of people who die homeless and the fact that no one was collecting that before the Bureau decided to do it just shows how easy it is for people to be invisible. So where's the hope? Yeah, sorry, we are a bit the misery museum <laughs> at times. <laughs> But there is also hope. Um, now we're going to hear uh, our final story, um, the story of the memorial card. Thank you, Lisa.
past effects here, yeah, but I don't believe it's an excuse to live in such a crap life. I believe that um, there's a lot of professionals out there that can have trained to obviously work with people like my mum and other people in this situation now. And um, it takes, I think it really takes someone that's actually been through it, been through it and been into that situation to make a big difference to somebody else's life. Like the last social worker that I had with my son, she had been through it. So she had more understanding with me and more sympathy. And, and, and I believe, I mean, I do believe that it's important that people have actually experienced it and been through it and can feel that empathy, that sympathy and everything that you're going through can kind of make it easy for someone else to make to want to change their life and get help and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just nice to know that people have been through a bad patch in their life and they've come out and they're making a difference to other people's lives because instead of ruining your life and wasting it and thinking, oh my God, my life is so rubbish, I'm just going to be a sad old person and just sit, just be on my own. And it's not actually because you could actually give a lot to people, because there's a lot of homeless people out there. There's a lot. I mean, even just walking through Manchester Town Centre and seeing the homeless people there begging, and um, I know a lot of them, and it's sad to see them, see them in that situation, but I just feel like the government must be enjoying not watching people going through like this, because how is they not helping people? Like, there's the only one with the power. So, like, how do they do that? And all we can do is protest and stuff like that it's to make awareness. But are they actually, are they really, are they really watching? Are they taking it seriously? Because why, why, why is people still in that situation? I couldn't imagine taking a crack away or anything, ever. Ever. I mean, it scares me to even, to make it, to make it, to know that it can make it that bad. So no, I'm not going to do anything like that because it's made me realise that you have to be a better person, especially when you want to help. And that's it with me. I'm not going to ruin my life because all I want to do is come out of the situation and help other people that are in the situation. So, so yeah. Can you hear me anyway? Do I need the mic? Okay. Thank you, Lisa, for that object story really beautifully performed. And I think there's so much in that object story that I think probably resonates with everything that's been said already uh, at the conference. Um, but the empathy between people who are going through the issues, I mean, the way that object story um, talks about people who are rough sleeping in Manchester, there's no dehumanisation occurring there. There's just uh, real empathy and love and compassion. And I think it brings home so importantly that object story, the power of um, direct experience of the issues in and how, how powerful that can be in working towards change and in people supporting other people and making change happen. And that story really resonates with me because I have got experience of homelessness in my childhood and my um, years as a young adult and you wouldn't find that on our website because Museum of Homelessness it's not about my story it's not about me but the, some of the things that I went through some were very very awful and then there were good bits it's complicated you know like all of the stories but I use that to inform the work of the Museum of Homelessness, and that is my personal driving factor for wanting to do that work. So I think there's a real strength to be found in that, and I think that comes over time and time again, and I'm sure it was talked about a lot yesterday, and that object story is like, it's got some real rays of hope in there. Um, she was a wonderful young woman, it was a real privilege to meet her uh, in Stockport. So wanted to kind of kind of bring it to a close a little bit um, just with a few kind of a bit of a proposition really about um, what happened with Objectified because we did work with Lasana Harris and we did as part of the experience hand out neuroscientific questionnaires to people to fill in before and after and you know this isn't this is an art science project we weren't giving people MRIs they were filling in a questionnaire um, so 
it's indicative, it's a proposition. But what we did find was, of the 500 people who came to that, there was a significant reduction in the use of descriptive verbs and language for people who, had exper who experienced objectified, and it was an hour long. Um, and also, what was really what, what, what interesting was that a number of people who came to the show they were kind of invested. They were bought into the issues. Actually, that's one of the things that we get that people say to us a lot. Oh, how in Museum of Homes? How are you going to make any change if you everyone who comes like believes in what you're doing anyway? Um, and he said, um, <laughs> so we have to sort of think about that. Fair point. <laughs> um, he Lasana talks about how most people who he's done work with, they're kind of at the 1.5 level when they're in terms of their humanity ratings. I have to say, these are just he's literally sent these to us a couple of days ago. Um, so we're still kind of looking at the data, but most people who came were already at quite a high rating, but there was still a significant kind of jump in people's um, empathy around the issues. And I think the use of the, the kind of this moving away from the descriptive language, the kind of language which we would use to, you know, potentially dehumanize is a big part of all of that. So it's a really interesting set of fi findings. I think what is, Matt, do you mind just quickly going back to that? I think what is really interesting about that for me is the thing, so the thing about dehumanized perception is no matter how good a person so it's not about being a good or bad person, right? It's involuntary. It's a neural defense mechanism. So no, no matter how woke we think we are and how much we you know, work in homelessness every day or anything like that, all of us will and have this happening in our brains at, at times and all of us can combat it simply by being aware of it and just working to mitigate it. So that's what these findings tell me the most because all of the people who came to our event were like, probably very invested in making social change and there's still a massive jump even though they started up higher than the general public so i think you know to me that's a lesson for for all of us in this room and since i've been doing that research i've caught myself when i'm doing it um and it has enabled me to be more effective in my interactions with people so it felt like there was a need for that kind of space it felt like that there was a need um for a sort of different kind of storytelling one that's sort of unafraid of complexity doesn't you know sugarcoat is honest and devolves power and perhaps that's a way forward in terms of representing homelessness and we want to do more work in that way for anyone who's interested in the museum of homelessness we have a, an exhibition on at st martin in the fields in london at the moment we're continuing with the dying homeless project mentioned earlier amongst other things so that's a little bit about object storytelling and i hope you kind of keep in touch with everything that we're doing um i want to thank um the University of Lincoln, and uh, particularly Owen, who's organized uh, the conference, um, Kate as well. And um, to, I want to thank Gary, who's journeyed up with us today um, to, to kind of be part of, uh, of proceedings. And finally, Lisa as well, our brilliant storyteller. Um, can we get another round of applause? I will. Thank you.